I'm delighted to be back here at Blockchain Futurist. This is Canada's foremost Web3 event. I think it's also the longest running. And it's a great opportunity to reconnect with colleagues and friends, both here in the city and who are visiting from around the world. And it's also a very interesting time for this event to be taking place. And that's because we're in this interesting period. Every once in a while, a new technology emerges that transforms the economy, the social order, culture, in some pretty profound and unexpected ways. And we've seen that play out time and again, most recently with the rise of the web, the internet, but before that, it was you know, TV, radio, steam, all the way back to the printing press. And now we're in a period where several new technologies are all emerging at once, each of which has the potential, in my view, to be as disruptive as any that have come before. The first of these, of course, is blockchain, the technology behind cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin. Blockchains are the first digital medium for value, a way for individuals, businesses, and so forth to be able to use the web as a way to move and store assets peer-to-peer -peer without the need for an intermediary. The second of these technologies is AI. AI is a, an overnight success story that's many decades in the making but recently has hit a key inflection point and I think is going to transform the world of business uh, and also create a lot of disruptions that we're not really prepared for. The third of these technologies is extended reality. For 30 years, we've accessed the web in a two-dimensional way. First it was with PCs, then it was with smartphones. And every so often we get a hardware upgrade. And so the question is, is extended reality, virtual reality and augmented reality going to be a part of that equation? And the fourth of these is IoT. Not just you know, smart home sensors or devices that measure your glucose, but devices that can think, thanks to AI, and do transactions, autonomous economic agents. And I'm here today basically to tell you that these technologies are not separate. They are related. I think there's a lot of discussion, especially within the crypto community, that, you know, oh, well, interest in crypto has waned and it's picked up in AI. I think that is a uh, pretty minimalist way of looking at this. Uh, these technologies are, I think, on a convergence course. In the same way that the term internet began really just by describing a narrow set of networking technologies, but now when we use the term, we're talking about many technologies, new business models, new social behaviors, new cultural phenomena. It is an all-encompassing term. In the same way that internet has moved from describing one set of technologies to describing an era, I believe the term Web3 is also going to describe the next era. So the internet is entering a new era. So the first era of the internet was the internet of information, right? When you use the internet today to send and move information, you're not sending an original unique thing. You're sending a version or a copy, right? So if you send someone an email and you put an attachment in it, you can send the same attachment to someone else. If you access a website, anybody can see uh, or if you host a website, anyone can see that information. If you post something on Twitter, it's available for all to read. So in many respects, the first era of the internet is kind of like a printing press for information. And in the same way that the first era of the printing press transformed information industries, the internet was broadly a positive thing. But when it comes to things that have value, things like money, or stocks and bonds, or titles and deeds, property and so forth, being able to create copies of those things it's not such a great idea. So instead of sending someone an email, let's say you were sending them 20 bucks. It's really important that they know they're the only ones who have that money, that you can't create a copy and send it to someone else. Because if we can copy money the way we can copy information, the money becomes worthless. And this is the double spend problem that Satoshi defined in the Bitcoin white paper. How do you create a way to move value on the internet without leaving behind a trail of breadcrumbs? How do you provide a proof that transactions are final? And because this didn't exist through the first era of the internet, we've had to rely on intermediaries, middlemen and platforms that sit in the center of transactions and uh, perform an essential role. They establish the identity, um, they create trust, and then they do all this uh, business logic, right? Clearing, settling, record keeping, all the rest of it. And these intermediaries have um, done an okay job, but they've got some pretty big limitations. They're centralized, which makes them vulnerable to hacking or to attack or to being co-opted by powerful forces. They, are, um, they add cost. They slow things down. 
and they capture data and information about people. And that's creating a, an asymmetry online where platforms have gained control at the expense of users. So what if the internet was entering a new era? From an internet of information to an internet of value. Well, the Bitcoin white paper laid out the case for how you could create a digital medium for value online. And what was really remarkable about Bitcoin was that it worked. There had been other attempts to do something similar. You know, Mark Andreessen, the inventor of the web browser, said that the original sin of the web was not putting in a version of digital money into the internet. Later on, Bill Gates, in his 1998 book, said that every person should have a digital wallet that allows them to transact using internet-native money. And even Elon Musk, the predecessor to X.com, which became PayPal, uh, originally began as an internet money startup. But all of these guys couldn't figure out the double spend problem, and Satoshi did. So in the 2016 book, Blockchain Revolution, um, which I co-authored, we made the case for how the underlying technology of blockchains, if they can work for Bitcoin, they can work for other assets. We can use this as a way to move and store and manage money and assets and value in the economy in ways that have never been done before. Now, a lot of water has gone under the bridge since we wrote that book. Uh, at the time, the market cap of the entire industry was maybe eight or nine billion US dollars. So if it was a publicly traded company, it'd be you know, as big as Under Armour or The Gap or something. So it wasn't a yet changing the world. And today, here we stand um, with a two and a half trillion dollar asset class. So in many respects, uh, it's been an incredibly successful period. But at the same time, there have been a lot of setbacks. And I think that there's been a lot of mud that's been thrown on the windshield that has kind of obscured people's point of view and made it very difficult for them to understand and appreciate the way in which this technology is changing the world. So I set it upon myself to basically try and you know, set the record straight. And last year released this book, Web3, which became a, a bestseller in Canada and the United States, and it's being translated into six languages. The book lays out the case for how blockchain and related technologies are changing different parts of uh, the world. Right? So the book begins by looking at assets. What does this mean for value? And I've mentioned how this is the first medium for value, so that's where we should begin. But then it looks at what does it mean for individuals, internet users? How does it impact organizations? How will it transform different industries? There's a lot of time spent thinking about you know, moving money, finance, and so forth. But as we well know, these technologies are impacting many industries. Um, how is it going to impact how we access technology, our experience as human beings? And finally, what does it mean for civilizations? So the word cryptocurrency, um, it's not a bad word, but it's a bit confusing, I think. Because when people use it, they're talking about every single token and digital asset. Sometimes people call those all cryptocurrencies. And a currency is actually a very particular thing, right? The classical definition is that it's a store of value, it's a medium of exchange, it's a unit of account. You know, the US dollar is a currency. Bitcoin is trying to be a currency. It's mostly there, but maybe not quite all the way there. But a lot of other tokens are trying to do something entirely different. So the way that I think about it is simply that tokens are like containers for value. In the same way that a shipping container can contain computer parts, furniture, food, clothing, and so forth, a token is a standard economic unit, digital unit, that you can use to program anything of value, right? So it can contain money, like, I don't know, a US dollar stablecoin. It can also contain a share of a common enterprise, security token, or RWA. Um, it can contain art or a collectible. It can contain data or attributes of people's identities, you know, credentials that we might use to access a community. A token is an infinitely programmable uh, tabula rasa, right? You can think of a website sort of as a container for information. A website can be programmed to represent anything of information. A token can be programmed to represent anything of value. In the book, I also talk a lot about individuals. The way things kind of work today as an internet user is that you interact with all these different services. It could be your bank, social media company, government, you name it. And you create all this data, which they then use and monetize. But you don't get to control or keep that data, and you don't get to participate in the economic upside. So in a way, this is sort of like digital feudalism. Now, in my view, 
the last 10 years, sort of the, the era of wild and crazy innovation in Web3 has really been focused on digital assets, right, tokens. But I actually think that the next era will be based on digital personhood, especially with the rise of AI. If there are tens of billions of autonomous AI agents trying to replicate what humans do, we need different ways to show our proof of humanness. And I think that Web3 tools are really the only way to get there. This is Clay Christensen, who wrote a really great book that I encourage everyone to read if you haven't, called The Innovator's Dilemma. And if you've heard of this book, you might um, know a little bit about the thesis. Basically, his um, book asks this sort of simple question. Why do great companies fail? Oftentimes, it's the best-run firms in any given industry that have a hard time embracing a new technology. And he said, if you look at it, the reason is that when new technologies emerge, oftentimes they're not useful for the core market, but they might be really, really useful for a new market. And as the technology scales, the new market begins to assume the old. So here are a couple of examples. In the 1960s, Japanese motorcycle manufacturers brought small engine uh, motorcycles to the United States. Big Harley driving Americans didn't want those, but off-roaders did. And eventually, the off-road motorcycle market came to be 20 times as large as the market for highway motorbikes. Another example is computing. During the 1960s and 70s, the big trend was towards a thing called a mini-computer, which was basically a dumb terminal hook up, hooked up to a mainframe. And these mini-computers, people thought, were going to be the future of computing. But the PC came along. The PC, by every metric, was an inferior device. But it was different in that it opened up a new market. Computers weren't things that you know, researchers and programmers used. They, were, they became household appliances. So what, what Christensen says is it's hard to gauge how big a market is going to be. You know, what is the market for AI? Well, a lot of people talk about it in terms of cutting cost. We can use AI to reduce call center operators, and that'll save your company X hundreds of millions of dollars. That may be true, but probably the innovation from AI is going to be way stranger than that, and it's going to be hard for us to anticipate. When it comes to blockchains, it's often, you know, the global remittance market is $600 billion, and the average fees are about six, or sorry, 9%, so 50 to $60 billion of fees. As Jeff Bezos said, you know, your margin is my opportunity. So people look at stable coins and they think, this is going to eat that market. That also might be true, but we know that the innovation that's going to happen from this technology is going to be much stranger. So in the book, I talk about several industries. I want to just drill down on one, which is close uh, to me, because it's where I've worked my whole life, uh, which is financial services. So this is a photo of a thing called a Rube Goldberg machine. And a Rube Goldberg machine is basically a device, a very convoluted device, that performs a whole bunch of silly steps, and then it solves a simple problem, like it cracks an egg or closes a door. In many respects, and I know it because I work in it, this is kind of how the financial industry operates, right? Everyone thinks it's digital and everything moves at the speed of light, but actually, what you're really seeing is sort of the front end of the industry. Behind the scenes, there's technology that's been layered on other technology that in many respects requires 80 or 90 year old programmers to debug. So you can think of a lot of innovation in financial services, what's known as FinTech, not as uh, some overarching category that crypto is within. You can think of fintech as just digital wallpaper. It is a fresh coat of paint. It is a new user interface that makes it a little bit easier to access finance. But whether you're using a robo-advisor or an online trading app or you're using a payment processor like Stripe or any of these other companies, and they're all innovative companies, you're still, in the end, interacting with banks and brokers and custodians and clearing houses and all these old traditional companies. So what crypto and you know, DeFi as a subcategory is trying to do is kind of reimagine the industry from the ground up. Now, Wall Street loves Bitcoin, and now apparently Ethereum uh, with the launch of ETFs in the United States. And you know, by almost every respect, this has been the most successful ETF launch in history. These assets have gathered a net over 16.5 billion US dollars. Bitcoin ETFs are responsible for 25% of BlackRock's ETF business in terms of their growth this year. 
25% um, of the growth, and in Fidelity's case, it's half of the growth in their entire ETF business. So that's kind of cool. It's, it would be amazing, like if you had a st stood on the futurist stage 10 years ago and said that this was going to happen, not many people would, you be would believe you. But there's something more interesting happening than that, uh, which is that Bitcoin is programmable money. It's basically software. And the concept here is simply that we can take that concept and apply it to every single function of the industry. You know, what does the financial services industry really do? Well, it gives us a way to store value, move value, access credit, trade and invest, uh, to connect investors with entrepreneurs, to organize financial information, to insure against risk, and so forth. Every one of these functions can be replaced with Web3 uh, technologies. So, insuring value. Um, prediction markets, which harness the wisdom of the crowds and put basically meat on the table, right? Money on the line to accurately price risk. Well, prediction markets anticipated that Biden would drop out many weeks before pundits came around to the idea. On the eve of the disastrous debate that he had, the odds of him dropping out were already 20%. If you'd asked, you know, pundits and pollsters, they would have said the odds were near zero. So people putting money on the line were able to accurately predict risk. I wrote this up recently for a Fortune magazine, which is basically that, you know, for the first time ever, uh, citizens have a way to wager, <laughs> if you will, on the outcome of political events. Now, you might say that, well, that's the influence of money in politics. Well, money's been involved in politics forever, and it's always been big companies and other powerful lobby groups. Now individuals at least have a seat at the table. But prediction markets can be used for a lot of other stuff. What, what if you're a farmer and you want to hedge against a, you know, a drought or a bad crop season? Well, you can predict that there will be a certain amount of rainfall within a year or not as a way to offset the risk. Um, you can base your investments on predictions about earnings that come out from big public companies. You can make predictions on whether one company will acquire another and so forth. Um, and even uh, governance. Vitalik has talked a lot about this idea of using prediction markets as a way to incentivize people to perform more in the governance process. What about moving value? Well, stable coins have done over $25 trillion of volume and counting. Um, last year, stable coins, USDC in particular, did more volume than the Visa network. And even despite the fact that the broader crypto market is not uh, back to where it was in the last cycle, stable coins are almost at an all-time high. What about decentralizing value exchange? Right now, we are at the point where decentralized exchanges account for more volume um, than they ever have. We're hitting a key inflection point of 15%. And pretty soon, I think most value exchange in crypto, a lot of it at least, is going to be happening uh, on-chain. Right? doesn't mean there won't be exchanges that act as on-ramps and facilitators and so forth, but a lot of the actual transaction volume is moving on-chain. And if it can work for crypto, it can work for every other asset. This is a good opportunity for me to talk briefly about a company that's based in Toronto. Now, full disclosure, um, Noble has sponsored, generously sponsored the um, book signing that I'll be doing right after this event. So thanks to Noble, everybody here will have an opportunity to get a free copy of my new book. And if you like, I'd be happy to sign it. First come, first serve, I think we have about 150 copies. Looking around here, I think um, it'll be pretty tight, but we should cover everybody off. So Noble is an organization based in Toronto that is helping to onboard US dollar stable coins and other real world assets onto the Cosmos blockchain. So Cosmos, as many people know, is another project started by a group of people, including many Canadians based in Toronto, and has grown into one of the, technically one of the most sophisticated and most admired platforms. But in order for a blockchain to be useful, it needs assets. And so Noble is doing that. Um, they've had um, issuance in the uh, ecosystem of over $500 million a month. And the TVL of 242, it's actually at, I think, 246 and a half right now. So um, Cosmos connects various different blockchains. Application developers can be the you know, masters of their own fate. And now they can use a Cosmos native US dollar as a way to do transactions, which is pretty cool. They're not just focused on USDC. They're also focused on lots of other assets. As I said before, a token is a container for value. 
If you can in, onboard a US dollar stablecoin onto a blockchain, then you can onboard uh, lots of other kinds of assets. But you need a partner that knows what they're doing. And, uh, and Noble is certainly one of those groups. So check them out, noble.xyz. And uh, if you'd like to learn more, I'd be happy to tell you more about it when we're over at the signing desk. So I mentioned earlier that we've accessed the web using kind of a two-dimensional medium, right? Computers, smartphones, and so forth. And there's a theory in computing that every sort of 20 years or so, uh, the technology interface for how we access the you know, computing changes, right? So there was mainframes, and there was mini computers, and there were PCs, and there were smartphones. And the iPhone came out uh, almost 18 years ago, right? So it's actually almost been two decades. So weirdly, like we've kind of been in the smartphone era. And a lot of people have high hopes for what that next era is going to look like. I don't know whether or not VR or XR is going to take off, but I do know that we are entering this new era. The mobile app, the Web 2 world, was a smartphone device with applications. The Web 3 world, whether or not it's a, wall, uh, excuse me, a PC or you know, a smartphone, the software interface is the wallet, right? You think of wallets as like web browsers, basically, for the internet of value. I'm going to actually skip over this, uh, just so I have some time for my concluding remarks. So Silicon Valley was once called a tech Galapagos because of the very unique blend of talent, capital, government R&D, universities, other institutions, you know, tech firms, manufacturers, and so forth, that created this very unique environment that led to a special species of company, you know, the internet giants, that survived there and thrived there. And those companies ultimately came to dominate the first era of the internet, but also really came to dominate the economy. So a lot of people ask, you know, where's the Silicon Valley of the future going to be built? Well, probably it's going to be built in Silicon Valley, um, but also a lot of other places too. It's probably not going to be one single place. I think we found uh, you know, that technology tools allow people to work from anywhere, and I think that Web3 tools accelerate that process. But place is still important. Where you live, where you work, where you make your life uh, still matters. So I, I think people don't really re realize this, n not entirely, but Ethereum is basically the most successful thing that's ever come out of Canada, except for maybe like Wayne, Wayne Gretzky or something like that. Um, no, the most successful business, certainly. And it's not a business, it's a, you know, a blockchain network with a native token and so forth, but this thing is worth $500 billion. That's three and a half times as big as Shopify was at its peak. That's four times larger than RBC our biggest bank and the, one of the 10 largest lenders on the planet. This is a thing that should be celebrated in Canada, and it's not. And that is extremely unfortunate, but it's not too late. So I wrote an op-ed recently for the Toronto Star, um, making the case that if you look at the early days of Futurist, the early days of Web3, you know, there was a lot of Bitcoin activity happening here in Canada. Some of the Bitcoin core developers were in Canada. Uh, Ethereum is a made in Canada project. We heard from Anthony Diorio, who's in the building, one of the founding members of that team. Um, Cosmos, as I mentioned, came out largely out of a group of Canadians. So this country has everything um, to make itself a successful Web3 innovation center. But we need to get four things right. <laughs> Number one, we need to depoliticize crypto. Crypto is not partisan. Web3 is not partisan. Web3 is a technology toolkit that anyone can use to better their lives. And we need to stop talking about it as if it belongs to one party or one ideological group. Number two, we need to adopt a pro-Web3 national strategy. Parliament actually developed this entire strategy last year. 14 points, you know, regime for stable coins, um, clarifications around custody and so forth. None of these things have been implemented. We have the roadmap, we should follow it. Number three, we need to prioritize investments in blockchain and other uh, Web3 technologies. This is something Canada and other countries are doing in lots of other areas. You know, we have a national industrial strategy for AI, EV batteries, and so forth. We need a national industrial strategy for this as well. And the final thing is, as a broad point, we need to make it easier for people to take risks, to start companies, um, to build businesses here because private sector, uh, small business job creation is responsible for most job growth in the long term. You cannot have a few big organizations in the government 
pulling the ship. We need entrepreneurs to want to build here in Canada, and we need to make it easier for them to do that. So that's my platform. Um, if you want to be part of this, let's talk more about it. So I'll just end with this. Uh, my new book is called Web3, Charting the Internet's Next Economic and Cultural Frontier. And I chose this term frontier very intentionally. Um, you know, a lot of frontiers in human history um, have required superhuman strength or expert ability, right? Or a lot of money, venturing to the moon, you know, going to Mars, uh, you know, crossing an ocean and so forth. But the most bountiful of frontiers in human history are typically the ones that are actually pushed by everyday people. Everyday people who, driven by opportunity or uh, circumstances, pick up and hit the trail. And I think that this time is very similar. But the difference is this. All frontiers in human histories have been bounded, right? They're geographically bounded. They're limited by resources. The web, and, and Web3 in particular, is the only econo economic frontier that is unbounded. It is an infinite economic frontier. And so it has an infinite, in my view, set of opportunities. But even the most enterprising and adventurous frontiers person needs a guide. And with some humility, I hope that you choose my book as that guide. Thank you very much. This has been very fun. Thank you very much. <laughs>